Hey everyone, my name is Shane A. Bassett, the movie analyst, your host. Uh, today I'm having a chat to a director of a movie called Control. I saw it only about two hours ago and enjoyed it. And I'm here to find out about behind the scenes with the director, executive producer. Were you a writer also? Yeah, I was a writer. Yeah, that's what I thought. So uh, please let me introduce to you Jean Flays. Hello from Australia. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Mate, I'm doing well. And thank you for getting up early because of the time differences. Usually usually it's the other way around when I interview people overseas. I'm getting up at like four o'clock in the morning or something. Oh, yeah, you got it the other way around today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so what's the Jean Feliz story? Uh, how did you become a filmmaker? Was it something that you always wanted to do as a career or did you go another avenue first? No, I, I, it definitely wasn't something that I, I thought of doing. I grew up on a small island um, just off the south coast of England. So for me, film was, was a million miles away, you know, figuratively and literally. Um, you know, it was so far away from anything. When I grew up, what I wanted to be was a, a radio presenter. Um, okay. I, I, and so I uh, I started in hospital radio and worked my way through up to uh, all the local radio stations and kind of did what I could do, you know, where I was. And that was the time in which I moved away uh, to to, um, to the mainland uh, in England. And uh, and so then carried on my radio presenting uh, over here. And yeah. it was during my time in radio where I'd kind of achieved what I wanted to achieve with it. And I was doing a lot of radio producing when uh, a guy who was working with at the time said, do you want to come and join me and, and work in television? I was just like, I have no idea what that entails. You know, it's, it's so different. And they were like, no, it's fine. It's, it's just radio, but with an extra level of vision. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, okay, let's give it a go. And so, so I did that, and and spent a lot of my my twenties working in uh, in broadcast television, um, and and like got to see the world and things like that. I I loved it, um, and thought at the time, you know, that that's it for me. You know, television is is where I'm at, and was really really happy with that. And then a similar kind of thing happened again, where it was another situation where someone said, you know, and um, there's this opportunity to to be a, a an executive producer on Nick Love's film Outlaw at the time. This was 2006. Okay. Um, you want to do that? And I was just like, again, I have no idea. Like, where, did, where would you even start with that? And uh, but I was just like, oh, I'll give it a go. Never, no, never pass on an opportunity. And uh, and for me, that was it, that. Then started uh, another almost ten year journey in, in producing films. And uh, well, the one thing I always said, though, I never wanted to direct because I don't want to have to deal with actors because as a producer, they're the last thing you want to deal with. They're just problems. They cause headaches. They're, <laughs> they're contract problems. And uh, until uh, the opportunity came up for me to direct a film and I was just like, OK, let's uh, let's give this a go just once just to see if I kind of like it. Not not really knowing what it was going to be like and I absolutely loved it and so ever since then I've I've been um directing as my as my main focus and I write kind of um to fill the gaps um and uh you know it's it's my career has been a bit like that it's been these kind of twists and turns not really knowing where each of those two main points yeah that were, that, were, that they were going to happen but you know, it's it's all led to this, and and now for, for you know the last what ten years or so, I felt very very comfortable in 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 where I'm at now, and can't see another potential change on the horizon. But you never know. <laughs> so maybe no going back to TV broadcasting or radio, or do you dabble in that still? I uh, about the closest I get to to radio broadcasting is being interviewed, and and TV, I think you've you've got to have such uh it, it is a bit of a nomad lifestyle doing that especially for live broadcast way where, where it's i was traveling around the world constantly which was great at the time but yeah. i've got my wife and kids now and and so, yeah <laughs> sometimes it would be great to get away and have that <laughs> of course <laughs> well I, I know what you're saying the hidden message is there <laughs> So you brought up on an island. Was that like near Cornwall or um, just far, further away from the mainland, or was it? It's about. Of... I think it's about about um, about sixty kilometers south of Cornwall. I think oh, roughly down okay. thereabouts. It's 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 actually closer to France. It's in the 
it's in the in the, the kind of bay at the top near Sherville. Okay. Um, is, is where it kind of sits. So it's a it's the, the there's a local patois language there. It's Guernsey French, so it's kind of half English, half French mess, yeah. basically. Well, if you can, maybe you should go back there for a location shoot one day. And funny enough, I, I did shoot part of a film there in in two thousand and eight, okay. and we needed this this island, the most exotic looking island we could have. Now, Guernsey, as part, I said, it's a bailiwick of islands, and one of the islands is called Herm, and they call it um, Britain's paradise, yeah, because it does have this stretch of beach that, if you catch it on the right day, it could pass for somewhere tropical. Naturally, <laughs> when we went, it was not that day. It it was oh, written wow. as somewhere tropical, and it was raining. It was stormy. It couldn't be more grey, oh. and so uh, so yeah, that was probably I learned my lesson then. Don't go back there to shoot. <laughs> uh, and before we move on to control, tell me, uh, you said you were world travelled. Have you ever been down under? Have you ever been to Australia? You know, Australia is the one continent that I've I've not been to apart from uh, uh, the Arctic, and uh, you know, I, I it's it's one I've always wanted to you know and and i've been lucky that most of my traveling has been kind of at least work semi work related and it's yeah. the one place where work has, has never taken me so I'm, I'm i'm yet to come although i do have a lot of friends down there my my editor and composer on control that i've worked with for uh 12 years um is australian uh, he lives oh. near brisbane okay. so uh so yeah i've got got a lot of a lot of connections to australia but just haven't been physically myself mentally and and, and in spirit of course Good to hear. Well, there's plenty of uh, film studios down here and, and opportunities, so you never know your luck one day, right? Definitely, absolutely. <laughs> now, with Control, it sort of focuses on a self-driving car. Is there many of those in the UK? I mean, it was an interesting, well, con con interesting concept, simple, but... Yeah, of, I mean, ev yeah. every Tesla is capable of it. Um, it's and it's uh, I think it's authorized in certain states in the US currently yeah. um, and it's borderline here. It's not going to be long before it's approved. Um, eventually, it's kind of inevitable. It's just kind of they're dragging out the safety concerns as long as possible. And this has made me think, thank God. <laughs> um, but, you know, it is something that I say they're all capable of and they all have this, you know, smart summon feature on them where the car okay. will come to to wherever you are so you know if you you leave a, a joy, enter a parking garage where your car is you know three floors up somewhere else you just call the car and it will come to you that is a working feature mm -hmm. on teslas and that was what first made me think about this idea for projects first of all i thought you know the, the child in me thought that's amazing it's like batman where he calls the calls the batmobile and then uh and then i thought that's also quite terrifying really because if you could do that, it obviously means the car can be controlled by your phone. And obviously a lot of the cars like those are controlled somewhat, at least, by, you know, they're tethered to your phone. I thought, yeah. well, you know that as phones can, can be hacked and are hacked, could you, in theory, you know, get in between the two and somehow control that? And that was really what it was. It was just trying to, to, to pull a seed out of, out of that idea, really. Well, I want to congratulate you just for getting the film made. I mean, it's a, I'm, I'm assuming, you're welcome. You're, I'm assuming it was a low budget. You probably had limited time. You had a limited cast. Uh, how really? long was how long was concept to you know final cut basically yeah. till till the wrap? This, this tends to be the bit where people go, "Oh, you did a good job too." Actually, that's quite good. <laughs> basically, um, I came up with the idea. Um, it was the day after my wedding in September 2022, and it was ready and selling in Cannes in May 2023. So just a few months from literally idea to finished film, you know, selling uh, uh, with, with uh, sales agents. Actual filming, we did m all of the main unit filming with the actors uh, in seven days, um, one six day chunk and yeah. one day pick up afterwards um and it, it naturally it's it's post production and sales that are the thing that takes the time really but um yeah massively limited and really it was we didn't do that because it would be fun to short it in such such a short period of time it was budget related and this yeah. was this was pre um Kevin Spacey's trial so yeah. we obviously nobody really knew how that was going to turn out so we had to err on the side of caution in yeah. terms of our budgets and everything else, which meant 
that it had to we had a limited time to shoot so which is why the shoot was so short and which is why we had to have the film ready for for that can you know so that you know it was it was it was done and ready to go by then well i'll get to the inevitable question about mr spacey shortly but i want to talk about lauren as well uh Oh, she, yeah. was great. she was great. But what were the challenges then? If you say you were filming it in that short amount of space of time, how? Yeah. what were the challenges of making that dialogue to, to remain interesting? Because, I mean, you know, you could lose people. Were you changing it on set or was it what, what you wrote? Is that what happened in the film? What, what the finished? Yeah, film? well, what, what we, we were kind of constricted as to how we could do it because we had the script by November. And we had um, Kevin record his dialogue first. That was that was his choice as a creative decision, so oh. that Lauren would have something more reactive to react to, rather than him just doing it afterwards, which would normally be the case. Yeah, yeah. So he he wanted to give her his performance so that she could react, um, you know, more appropriately off it. That makes which was sense. Great. Yeah, yeah. So what we then did is Lauren took that away and literally tried to memorize his performance. Then we had a stand-in on set because what I didn't want to do was just pipe it into her ear because you're you you mentally as an actor you'd always be aware that that's a recording and you're acting opposite a recording and it's never quite the same. So I also had a stand-in um, learn the dialogue the way that Kevin did it as well. Yeah. So then what we had was on set the stand-in gave a live performance, so they were talking to each other. That also enabled us to kind of play with it a little bit more so we could slip and like we knew what we could do with Kevin's dialogue, um, but still kind of keep it fresh. So what we, the way we had to treat it with such a short period of time, we treated the whole production like theatre, basically, in that we had very, very long takes. Some of the takes we were doing like 23 minutes long, which is crazy. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely, you know madness looking back but it was the only way really that we could get through it if she if she made a mistake or whatever we just carried on yeah. and then it meant that we could do three different angles two or three takes on each one and then cut between the angles that way and then that way if there were any issues we could just simply cut elsewhere and cut around them it was the only way we could have possibly done a shoot that short and and my first assistant director was saying you know really don't think we're gonna be able to do this we're not gonna be able to do this i was like we will we will do it and then uh I, I still don't think she was convinced until the end of the last day and then said, actually, we, you managed to do that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know you're telling me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So we did shoot basically what was what was on the page, largely because we had to by that point. We could play with it more when we were doing the original voice recording. Yeah. And then by that point, it was pretty locked in. But Lauren had been involved in the process as well and and Kevin. So the, the main ones that were going to have any kind of script or dialogue changes I'd kind of already had a, a, their input before then anyway. Well, uh, I would have assumed that Mr. Spacey was sort of um, in, uh, just looking closely. At, he wouldn't have been getting a lot of uh, offers to do movies, I'm assuming, and he would have been very tentative about what he accepted. How did you yeah. go about, you know, either approaching him or thinking of him? Had you met him before? Like, did you have a relationship already? How did you manage to get him on board, the Oscar winner himself? Yeah, well, we'd um, we'd spoken to Kevin's team previously about um, about eight months before we spoke to him about Control, about a different project that we were working on at the time. Right. And they, they were up front with us about the situation and said that, you know, it probably wouldn't, be something that they could do because of the, of his situation. They would probably look to do something that's that's a little bit more um, character driven and things like that compared to the project that we were talking about. But they said, yeah. if you ever have anything else, then please do come back to us. We'd love to talk more because they they we we had a good dialogue by that point and and they they liked uh, me and my work. They said so. Yeah. It was it was when we when I kind of came up with the idea for this for the first few pages that I'd written. I couldn't get Kiefer Sutherland's voice out of my head from phone booth. And I was just like, you can't do that. It's a bit like temp music in a film. If you do the go down that route, whatever music you have is never the same. And I thought, no, I've got to get this voice out of my head. And I thought, and that was the first time I, cause I don't really like to think as I'm writing too much about casting because it's very rare you actually get the person you want and then you're writing sure. for an actor and it doesn't work. So I was trying not to. And then I thought, and then Kevin just popped in my head and I thought, Ooh, because he's got that kind of unique voice that would that would he's it had all the qualities that I wanted out the role. 
old and thought, okay, I'm going to do what I don't normally do here and write it specifically for him from this point onwards and just really hope that if they don't like it, that I can find someone else. And that was kind of how I, how I treated it, really hoping that they'd at least read it or that Kev would at least read it. So I wrote it, got it done very, very quickly and polished and then sent it over. And Evan, uh, Kevin's manager, read it first and said he liked it Um, was sure that Kev would, would give it a read and come back to us. Sure. I kind of figured, okay, that's, that's probably it. That's probably as much as I'm going to hear. And then it was probably a couple of weeks later, by which point mentally I'd checked out, going, I need to think of something else now. And uh, and then we just got a, a call saying that um, Kevin really liked the project and wanted to talk to me. And okay. so it was just like, oh, okay. But he was he was travelling at the time, so it was try, trying to find an appropriate time in which to 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 talk. And uh, and it, we kind of kept going around it a little bit, and then. I got a call one day saying, "Are you are you available in London tomorrow to meet with Kevin?" And and I live about an hour's drive away. I was just like, "Yeah, absolutely, of course." Um, and that was it. That was that was that was it arranged. So then the next twenty four hours was mostly self doubt for me, thinking, "Oh God, he's just going to rip me apart for the script <laughs> and everything else." So it's the, <laughs> he's going to chas- you know, absolutely berate me for for uh, daring to come up with him with something like this and. Uh, and actually, we met with him, uh, myself and my producers and Lauren. We met with him um, in in uh, in London, and you know what? he was he was genuinely so lovely and uh, really nice about the project. And and Evan and Kevin both explained that they had been getting a lot of offers, but they were at a point where they needed to be careful about yeah. what they accepted. It needed to be the right projects at the right time and things like that. And they felt yeah. that this one could be that. So uh, so. We were really pleased, left there, um, uh, actually, as I usually do when I first meet actors, I usually like to try and give them something, not not a bribe, uh, it could, could come across that way, but, it, <laughs> but just a little token thing, just to make them think of the project. And so I gave Kevin and it was like, what do you get someone who's got two Oscars on their shelf? Like, yeah. there's nothing. So what I ended up getting in was just a little tiny matchbox car of a Tesla, um, oh. exactly, you know, what was written in the script. And he loved that. I, as I handed it over to him, I thought, oh, I've really messed this up. I should not. <laughs> and he actually loved it. Little did I know that he used to collect, he was given a matchbox car by, by one of his parents when he was young. Oh. And he, he collected them when he was younger. And he's still got his first one on a shelf. And he's put his new one on the shelf next to that one. So I was like, oh, win. <laughs> That's that's uh, fate or something. You know, I don't know if you believe in that, but it's yeah. definitely some sort of chemistry that brought you together then and and that gift was the perfect thing that was it yeah it worked so yeah i was, I was quite pleased with that so i got lucky there definitely and then and, uh, and then yeah. what there was was the uh, the natural negotiation process um, yeah so right. everyone was pretty much on board and that that took a bit of time um it took yeah uh, a couple of months to to really pull that together um and then even a bit of time after that to finalize everything but uh, yeah. but yeah, they were they were on board and very very keen. It was um it was third parties that really kind of had more of a more of an interest and things like that. But Kim absolutely was was all for it. And then uh, once we got the uh, the deal done, again yeah. it was it was kind of a very quick thing. It was okay. Uh, we could do the recording sessions this week if you like. And again, it was just like ah, oh, this was like. <laughs> five weeks before we were due to actually start main unit filming. So, you know, at this point, my house is becoming like a, a uh, studio with props, props and costumes coming together all around the place. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, it was crazy. Uh, so we did you sell it at Cannes, Khan with his name on it? Or was he attached? Like, what I'm trying to say is, were people hesitant because Kevin Spacey's name was attached to your movie? Well, we knew that if we didn't, we, the, the choice for us was we could either, for our budget level, we could have Kevin Spacey or we could have someone that most people haven't heard of. Now, mm. if we'd have gone with the latter, the film definitely wouldn't have been seen by the vast majority of people. Most people wouldn't have ever heard of it. It would have ended up at the bottom of the pile on, on streaming services and that would be the end of that. Um, or, you know, we could take this, what some perceived as a risk, um, and see what we could do. We knew, as soon as we made the announcement, we knew that the film would sell. 
because Kevin Spacey has still got a very, very strong and ardent fan base. So we knew that from a, yeah. a business point of view, it would it would be able to sell. And that was really, you know, why the decision was was made. It wasn't just a a, a, a snap decision. It was a it was a, a calculated business choice made between myself and, and my producers discussing, you know, what we could do with the time that we had available and the money that we had available, you know, would, would this be something that, that we could do? And so going into, into, into can, absolutely. It was, it was, had his name all over it. And that was the thing that got people interested. We knew straight away that the major studios weren't going to be able to do anything with it. Um, I had um, messages yeah. of support from them about it, about the casting, okay. because Kevin obviously is still a, a well-liked individual um, yeah. because not everybody knows the facts, but a lot of them have been friends with him for many years before everything that, that happened. So they can only take, you know, go sure. based on, on facts. And so they are still friends with him. And so I, I'd had messages of support from them congratulating us on having the the bravery as we often got called it. I don't think it was, but we, we got messages from that. So... Yeah. In can absolutely that was that was what it was about. It was being able to sell that, and then we, we had a huge amount of interest um, mm. from around the world. We had offers there and then on the table. Like we were we were going out for lunch and then getting phone calls. We've just had an offer in from this country, which yeah, was something we would have never have got if it was if we'd have gone with with a, a more unknown actor. No, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I think that's yeah, that's really a, a good achievement really, when you think about it, because you knew the risks that were there and and I think it's worked out quite well for you. Uh, people are talking about it or they will talk about it once it gets a little bit more out there. Yep. Uh, hypothetically, this is only hypothetically, would yep. you have ever considered not putting his name on all the posters and all the marketing and then just let people hear his voice and go... I know that voice. I know who that is. And then do you think that would intrigue more people or you definitely think the name on the advertising helped further? I think the name on the advertising helped because really yeah. that is, if I'm honest with myself, that's the reason that most people are going to watch this film. So if you sure. take that element out of it, you know, it really is for, as a selfish thing, it's a way for people to, to see my work, you know, yeah. and the work of my crew and the rest of the cast who all, all put everything into this. Yeah. It would be a shame to see that film disappear for something yeah. like that. We we did have offers from certain distributors, um, mostly in the UK, that asked us if we would take the name off. Uh, and we said no, because by that point, not only had Kevin's deal been done where we had agreed that he yeah. gets, you know, first billing on everything, you then can't, you know, change that reactively. And also, you know, it was part of the whole process to, to to unpick any element somewhere that happened, you know, back through the line is incredibly difficult, you know. So for me, it was it was it was how we started. So it was just something that we it was a decision that we made and we just had to stick to it for better or worse. And thankfully, touch wood, we, we got <laughs> really, really lucky with that. Um, you know, as I say, it was a, a it wasn't just a snap decision. It was a, it was something that we took some time thinking about, but it, it's it's worked out. You know, really really well. We got we got incredibly lucky there. Um, for, yeah. uh, as a production and as you know, filmmakers and you know, for for business reasons, you know, the the film is is making money. The film's you know already in profit despite not being released in any major territories yet, you know, which is, yeah. we've got, entirely got Kevin to thank for that. No, that's really well put. Well said. Um, yeah, no, you really helped me out on that one because I was just thinking you're going to get a lot of controversy and you're going to get a lot of people on the fence and either yeah. one way or the We're, other. Yeah, ever since we made the announcement, we got we got our fair share of that and I'm now yeah. very well um, adapted to, uh, to interviews normally where, some some could be quite you know aggressive in in that stance as to to why why why, but you know really the the reasons are simple for 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 us as filmmakers, you know it, it's it's it was an opportunity to be able to work with someone who has two Oscars more than I do you know no, it's yeah. it's not an opportunity that comes along very often and my whole life has been taking chances and taking never passing up on an opportunity so that would be yeah. that would be crazy. And you've given him this sort of chance, this opportunity and this role 
uh, and a little matchbox car. And yeah. he'll, rem he'll remember that. And you never know what might happen down the line. You know, you might end up working with him again one day. Exactly. That's it. And, and as I say, it's a, uh... I didn't. Exp I knew that we'd get a lot of support from Kevin's fan base. Um, mm. I was hoping that that would outweigh any negativity. What I didn't expect was a wash of of support from within the industry, who couldn't really say the, anything publicly because you know everyone's you know Again, got their yeah. own image to, to be concerned with. So I didn't expect that. That was a surprise to me. So that was quite that was quite rewarding to to have that to know that. You know the industry wasn't going to shun us or anything like that for making a terrible decision and and you know it's things like that that you realize that you know sometimes you know you never know quite what's going to happen and we, we, we i said we got some support from that and it certainly helped raise the profile of pretty much everyone else on this mm. film as well you know which, which has been quite quite helpful well speaking of other people in, in the film uh lauren metcalf yeah uh, her her uh, character of Stella is like the, pretty much almost the centerpiece, and she's almost on screen what ninety percent of the movie. Potentially, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Except yeah, you pretty the, much get the first few scenes without her, and then that's it. You're stuck with her till the end. Then <laughs> well, she, she, she's gorgeous. She's very pretty, and she is a good actor. So that that helps a lot when you're looking at at one person. Uh, Tell me about her. Like, did you you've worked with her before? I think, or is or you're working with her again? I believe. Uh, yeah, I, she, I, I, your friends. Yeah, I, I met. I've known of Lauren. We've been connected, as as is often the case in the industry. It's it's much smaller than most people realise. We've been connected and in the same circles and on social media and things like that. But we never actually met until I think okay. it was towards the end of one of the lockdowns you know, which feels like a thousand years ago. And that was the first time we actually met in person and, and we really got on on really well. And very soon after that, I kind of realised that she's she's got a lot of talent there in terms of, of mm. not just as an actress, but being able to be, she's got a very positive outlook and very determined. And that's a great quality as a producer. So, I, so we, on the other project we're working on, I said, you know, would you like to come on board this and 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 you know help us as a as a producer in the early stages? And she was a lot like me. She's like, well, I've never done it before. I, said, I don't want to do it. <laughs> and uh, and so we were working on this other project, and then control kind of happened and came up. And very very quickly, I I thought, okay, I need to know who I'm going to be writing this one for. This one has to be an unknown because we're never going to get a known actor to do ninety five percent of the film on their own. So that was when I, I thought, okay, I think Lauren will be good for this. And and bear in mind that I'd I'd only worked with her in a producer capacity, but I had obviously seen her show reels and things like that. Yeah. And really, really, I I thought she can do this from what I've seen before. It was along the uh, show reel had a lot of similar things to it in terms of emotional scenes, crying and things like that. And I thought yeah. she she can do this. She she can do this, and I can make sure I can do the best I can do anyway to make sure that her performance isn't stagnant and things like that that you don't get fatigue watching one person in a car seat for for most of a film well so yeah it, that's that's it, the trick not not being bored to death really exactly that's death. it so it was trying to just create the the highs and lows because each each film you know you, you've got to have you know peaks and troughs you can't have just one film that's all energy because audiences leave exhausted and bored at the same time you don't want a film that's completely flat so it was just trying to find enough peaks and troughs to when it starts to feel like it could go in that direction to kind of change change 180 a little bit, give something and just try and kind of keep it dynamic, but trying to be realistic as well. Because, you know, if it was too much going on, then it's, it, it stops being, you know, plausible. So it's just trying to find that balance, which I hope that we've come close to. It's not perfect. I know that I'm the first one to say that. But I think, you know, like any film, you, you know, you, you, you judge it, you know, pretty intensely yourself and you know i think it's it's it, it works well considering w what it is you know you you look at similar films um that like we did to begin with like phone booth like buried that are isolated in one place yeah you could absolutely yeah. see how it could become boring in one place so it was trying to find similar things to, as i say just to keep it entertaining and interesting which touch wood the feedback has been that it is yeah, no, you mentioned Phone Booth, Buried, 
Um, I, I have heard similarities to Locke. Had you seen Locke previously with Tom Hardy? I had seen Locke, yeah. And in fact, um, the the film itself obviously has a very. I, I, people had mentioned it to me after I'd first written Control, and they said, "Oh, you you must have seen Locke." And I was like, "No, I actually haven't seen Locke." And okay. then everyone kept saying to me, "You need to see Locke." And so I ended up watching it um, maybe two weeks before we started main unit filming. It was one night. I was I was stressed to the eyeballs, and uh, and my wife said, "Look, we just need to break away. Why don't we watch that film that everyone's been talking about?" So I'm like, "Okay, we'll watch it." And okay. in fact, whilst the subject itself is is different and and it's an entirely different film. I did love two shots, and in fact, I, I borrowed from those for control. And the shots outside of our car, where you look, you you're on the outside, and you're looking through the wing mirror in, into Stella in the in the in the passenger seat, it's directly from Lock. So there's two of those, and we called them when we were shooting them. We referred to them as Lock Shot One and Lock Shot Two. Oh, wow, um, okay. As our little, as our little, we, we say homage in the film industry. Yeah. We basically we style it, but uh, but it, I just thought it was it was such a good angle. It was it was a a fantastic way of seeing staying with the character but also making you feel like you're getting just a bit of breath from being stuck inside the car so <laughs> okay no that that was the other one that came to mind for me when i was watching it but you again i'm really glad that you paid played tribute to it almost <laughs> that's good yeah uh now uh, just quickly again on on lauren i wanted to uh reiterate that her acting is really supreme like in a sense where you're looking at her eyes dart sometimes she's breathing differently the way she speaks the way she's looking at the back seat all the time yeah. uh, for, for obvious reasons yeah i thought it was pretty fantastic that that role of her to sort of make it her own so yeah that that was yeah. good casting and i hope oh, i've seen you. more I of her yeah, I, I as I say, it was people say we took a risk on on Kevin. I think personally, the bigger risk was on Lauren because obviously this was this is an actress that I'd never worked with as a director before, and didn't have an, an awful lot of material. Like you only have to look at Kevin Spacey's work, and you can see what he's capable of in the last twenty years. Lauren didn't yeah. have that. Lauren is the one that pleased me most because that was the real tough one, and I I knew she could do it. But I also hoped she could do it, if that makes sense. Like, I knew in my heart she could do it, but then I thought, Jesus, I really hope she could do it. <laughs> but when we came to it on set, she was just fantastic. She was absolutely brilliant. And at one point, we were we were shooting the where it's near the finale. Bearing in mind, we're in a sound stage, So it's just a car in a studio that's got lots of lights and lots of bored, tired and hungry film crews staring through the windscreen out like that. And she managed to, towards this end scene, it's, it's when she's giving her final, like, monologue inside the car yeah. and talking to Kevin Spacey's character, talking slash shouting. And she she did this on set, and the first take that she did, it was incredibly powerful. I was getting, I even now I get kind of goosebumps thinking about it. And by the end of the take, it just went quiet. And I just left it a moment before cutting, and in that brief moment, I heard about four or five people, including my producer, Adam, sniffing beside me. I was so pleased because I'd been fighting off like a frog neck for the, last, for the previous five minutes myself. Right. It was so powerful, that performance that she gave. And in such a sterile environment that film set is, that was incredible to, to have that. So that was when I really knew for the first time, this is, this is special. Not just her performance, not just in the film, but as a, as a working relationship on Into the Future. And you're at that point, I'm not ever going to let her go. So. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, take her with you, please. Yes, um, she, she's, uh, she's, uh, she's very much um, attached by ball and chain to me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, now, I don't know if this was meant. You are the writer, so maybe it was meant. But I thought I heard a, a streetcar named Desire uh, reference because just... At before the car goes to a sudden halt right at the end, I hear Kevin's character, who I'll, I, I don't think he has a name, no. yell out, Stella, like Brando. <laughs> and then it, yeah. I, I it, couldn't it, it, help but think that. I don't know if that's yeah. correct. It, it wasn't intentional, but I have <laughs> had a number of people say that to me. Maybe I should say, yeah, yeah, that, that was intentional. Uh, well, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't at the time. Um, no, it was... It literally just written as as one word in the script just says Stella exclamation mark 
and that's it. The rest was Kev's performance, you know. So, uh, so yeah, it wasn't intentional, but it's one of the happy coincidences. Uh, yeah, I rewound it, had another listen, and I think maybe <laughs> Kev, maybe Kevin knew as well, and he just did his own. Maybe Kev did. Yeah, I, I can't say for him, but yeah, maybe he knew. Maybe he knew what he was doing. But, he's, but, he's the professional. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you should own it. You wrote it. You should own it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, okay, so before we wrap up quickly, uh, a sequel, maybe Stella is going to go to another country. She can come to Australia. She's driving for a living. And then all of a sudden, you know, Kevin's characters, without too much spoilers, could be still around. Pops up. There is, a, her. there is a very, very, very small post-credits scene, which mm. does allude to a uh, potential future. Mm. Mm. Um uh, for me, if I'm honest, it, it, it was just a way to be able to add a fun little zinger at the end. A little moment. Um, yeah, we, we don't have plans for, for a sequel. It was one of those things, during the drive back to the hotel each night, we, we, we would often um, joke and, and come up with ideas as to what could happen next. And, and the, the stand-in, um, Adam Hooper, who was doing standing in for Kevin on set, doing his voice, yeah. he was absolutely convinced that the sequel should entirely be about him and not him as a stand-in, him that actually it was him all along. He was doing a voice that sounded like Kevin Spacey. So oh. I'm sure he would be all up for a sequel that involves that. <laughs> That's a funny, another angle to look at it. Yeah, but if if you're content with just a one-off movie, I applaud you because, you know, so many people have, before they even get the first movie finished or released, they, they've got sequels in mind and that's not the right way to go about making an independent movie. I don't no, think... I don't I don't think so. I think unless you've got something like Lord of the Rings or something that's pre-established yeah. as a larger yeah. story, I think, you know, I think as as filmmakers, I think we should be grateful for any success that we have. I do. I don't think it's a prerequisite that that mm. you, that if you're successful, that's it, make sequels. I think, you know, it's our job to be um creative and appreciate each thing and if we get the opportunity to do a sequel treat it as a separate second film it shouldn't be just part of a chain and just the assumption that we're just going to keep having sequel after sequel of those because that's I, I it's not a side of the industry i'm a particular fan of i don't mind sequel there's plenty of sequels that i love oh, of course yeah. i don't i don't think you should go into it into any film thinking okay here's how we can do this and we can do this and we can do this because that's not the way i'd say we added that a little bit in yeah. um to, to the end of control but it's it's by no means I, would, I wouldn't even know where to start if someone genuinely said okay let's pick up that thread i, I wouldn't know so uh i'd hire a writer so okay. <laughs> so I, I think it's we should take each project each each story anew and and because and because audiences deserve that they don't just deserve to be just churned out you know yeah. the, the next part uh, do you um are you a director that walks around with a megaphone uh <laughs> no <laughs> no you're, you're very you're more subdued that's good to I, I, I am I, I like to keep my sets um pretty light um except for if there's key scenes like when we were doing like towards the end scenes of, of mm. control it's mm. it's not very fair on the actors if I'm, you know, keeping everything light and they've got to try and stay stay deep. So mm. I always, if it's outside of scenes like that, I always try and keep my sets light. I'm, I I like to talk to to everyone. Um, for me, I'm very very character driven. Um, I I trust my my technical team yeah. and to to get what needs done. Obviously, I, I will go through the shots and set up everything, but yeah. I, I I don't. I don't like to, to micromanage and shout and things like that. I, I prefer to be able to talk to the actors and, and yeah. get in there and just make sure everyone's happy because as much as our job is telling a story, you've got to make sure everyone's happy to be oh, able yeah. to tell the best story. So I, I, I say I, I prefer just if, if everyone's happy, you know, half your job as a director is is, is done. Is Then you've just got to concentrate on, on the undercraft itself. Well, um, what about director's chair? Do you have one with your name on it that you take to set to set? <laughs> I, I do, and it is literally the exact opposite side of my eye line to where I'm looking at oh, you now. I can right. see it over the top of my screen. Um, I'll yeah, have a look at it was... another time. Next time I talk to you, you can uh, sit on it for me. Or I'll, I'll slide it in discreetly in the <laughs> <Yeah>. background. <laughs> uh, was it always going to be called Control, or did you have other titles in mind? Um, I came up with the, with the title probably by about page two because I needed to put something on the title page. 
And as is always the case with pretty much everything I've ever done, yeah. I always think this will this will do just for now. And almost every time the the title ends up sticking because it just gets known as as that. So it, it was it was it's it's a temporary title that hasn't gone away yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any, I suppose there's a list as long as your arm, but what actors would you like to work with? Uh, any actors, actresses that are on your wish list for one day, maybe writing a role for or working on a project with? I think it's in, in, in the most um, boring answer possible. It's, it's for me, it's about just finding the right person for the right role. There are so many that I, th I think, Hollywood is, is an amazing place right now. And it is, it is, uh, there is an abundance of amazing talent that yeah. of, of and a huge amount of which I give all of my limbs to work with. So, you know, I think finding the right one to do, to do a project is, is key. Um, but yeah, I, there, are, there are so many that, I, that I'd love to work with that I couldn't, I wouldn't even know where to begin with a list. Uh, <laughs> let's just say all of them. <laughs> yeah, look, good answer. I, you, you shouldn't really say no to any actors that you, you know, you, you might not even know an actor and then they come along and you realise that, well, yeah, you did want to work with them because they're that good. So you're not exactly. labelling. Exactly. You never know where yeah. someone is in the trajectory right. of their career as well. I yeah. um, I went to see a play a few years ago um, called Sexual, Sexual Perversity in Chicago with yeah. Matthew Perry, Hank Azaria, um, Mini Driver, yeah. and a then unknown um, actress. And I can't remember her name now as well, which is really bad. Um, but she went on to do, she, she's probably become bigger than everyone except Matthew Perry. And and I, I I met with three of the four of them afterwards and didn't meet with, with her because at that point she was pretty unknown. And that right. kind of taught me a lesson back mm -hmm. then. That must have been 2007, I think it was. Yeah. That taught me then, you never, never doubt an actor because just because they're not, yeah. Big now it doesn't mean that they're not, not going to be, and so I ever since then, I think, I think as some kind of subconscious thing, I always take actors based on their their ability because if their ability is enough, it's it it could only be a matter of time before you know that they, they, they get that recognition for it. It's not mm -hmm. it's not a given, as as we all know, you know, so mm -hmm. much is about luck and being in the right time, and right yeah. place, and so many things. But if you've got the talent, that's that's the the main route there. So, uh, so it, it's yeah. You never yeah. know what someone's gonna gonna have happen in their career. So, yeah. so I, ever since then, I, I try to be more more open and and you know aware of 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 talent and ability. Good. No, good to hear because as a movie analyst and and someone who watches people in the background and just loves meeting someone who might have only had one scene in a movie, you yeah. know, I can I can talk to them for half an hour about that one scene or what their experiences is so you never know who who might be who in the future and everyone's got some kind of talent normally anyway so yeah exactly yeah that's it well, well, well sexual perversity in chicago was about last night uh, the movie do you know the movie about last night oh yeah yeah i've not seen yeah. that yeah yeah that was that was that was the play turned into a film so oh, i did not know that yeah, yeah. So the Demi um, Dem, Demi Moore and uh, Rob Lowe, Jim Belushi, yeah. yeah, and Elizabeth Perkins. Yeah, that movie was based on the play. Ed, Ed Zwick directed it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ed, Ed Zwick, oh. he directed it, so it was based on the play. And now they just still do it as a play. Um, it was remade. The movie was remade with a African American cast from memory. Yeah. But um, yeah, the original, the 80, 1986 Rob Lowe one. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Oh, I I will need to give that a watch for sure. <laughs> Good. Uh, to wrap it up, your final words. What do you What do you think people should give Control a go? I mean, I think they will now, having heard you, especially talk about Kevin and the way you've made it and the the effort that you really put into this film. You know, in such yeah. a short period. In your final, like your words, why should people choose to watch it? I mean, other than the fact that there is there is so much blood, sweat, and tears gone into into that project, you know, it is something quite unique. Um, we are at a, an age at a time in in the industry in in Hollywood where these kind of issues, um, due to um, cancel culture, if you want to call it that, and other things, yeah, are going to yeah. have a, have, a, have an impact on the way that you look at certain people. You know, including Johnny Depp and things like that. It is going to put audiences into to different positions. And for me, I think, you know, 
art shouldn't be about the individual. It should be about just watching a performance. And Kevin, like him or not, is one of the greatest actors of our generation. And, you know, just to be able to, to, to hear him again in this new performance, and it is a true performance, it's not just, you know, a phoned-in thing. I, was, I, I love how much he gave to this. Um, he really gave it, and it is a performance that, that is, it's, it's a new Kevin Spacey character, and that yeah. will never change, and that that means a lot to me. And, and I think for audiences to be able to, to enjoy a new character for him, to see new talent in the form of of Lauren, um, and a story that that could be a little bit somewhat prescient in in you know with AI and self driving cars and things like that. There's <laughs> there's a, a little bit in there for everyone, I think. I hope anyway. Well, it's um, I don't know. I don't think tel Tesla will approve, will they? Because no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think no, that. Was... Sorry, the, the the word the name used to be in the script, uh, and then yeah. uh, and then that was taken out because because uh, <laughs> a bit like how nobody uh, Volkswagen didn't want to have any part of Herbie the Love Bug when that came out until until it did really well, and then the second one everything's Volkswagen all over it. So you never know. Tesla might really love it and be all over a sequel. So <laughs> yeah, or. Well... Uh, famously, Eminem said no to ET, said no to Spielberg, and then they put Reese's. Yes, Reese's, of course. Yeah, so um, there's lots of incidences like that. So you're not, you're not, you're not alone there. Um, talking like okay. Mel, Gib Mel Gibson's having a bit of a resurgence, and he he went yeah. through a lot, you know. And, uh, Robert Downey Jr. and you mentioned Johnny Depp. So I yep. mean, yeah, it's it's the start of the beginning of the resurgence, maybe for. For Kevin and it's really good to see that you've got him you've got him in your movie and that's a major step for you in your career so congratulations again thank you very much I really appreciate that and I think you're absolutely right because you know that that there is a point where audiences just want to see the art it becomes more than that and and they want to see performances good performances because at the end of the day you know news and scandal is interesting to a point, but it wears off after a certain period of time. And then people just want to go back to it. That's the reason why Netflix have never taken um, House of Cards off of its platform or any other Kevin Spacey film off their platform. Right. They renew the licenses for these um, films all the time because they know people want to watch them. And yeah. ultimately, you know, that was our thinking behind it. You know, um, We didn't know how it was going to go, but ultimately it was something that, that paid off. I don't think we'd get Kevin again, even now, if we were to, if the whole thing were to happen at this point, I don't think we'd be lucky enough to get him. So it was just one of those things where timing was was on our side. And, and I do think that in the long run, I think um, Kevin will have um, lots more roles that, that with, with lots more success. Yeah, it's interesting because people don't forget. So your movie... If it's not initially well received, maybe, and I'm I'm hoping it is for you, but just hypothetically again, it might be something people revisit as well. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah, you know, it's... right now I do get that it's still a bit raw for some people. Yeah. Um, and the people but, remember know, that name and go, Why do I want to watch this movie? It, Kevin Spacey's in it, and then they'll come back to it maybe a, a couple of years or something. I don't know. Exactly. That's it. it, it it's it's probably got some longevity to it. I'd, I'd be I'd be lying if I said that wasn't something that we factored into into our decision, but you know it's 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 there. It is it's not going anywhere. It's like art is forever. It's going to be there whether people like it or not. Now, unfortunately, so uh, so it's there, and and you know people yeah. can dip in and out, and and you know if they they've got an evening some point now or in ten years time, they they might decide to watch it. Hopefully, anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I've already talked to you long enough. I know, but Mel Gibson had all these great under the radar performances. And it wasn't until Hacksaw Ridge uh, that really sort of yeah. brought him back into the limelight. And now I just reviewed a movie that he's in Desperation Road. And it yeah. really is a resurgence, it's a great film and I've um, been recommending it. So yeah, he's, oh, cool. people don't forget. So well, good luck and you, you're great, you talk, great talking to you, mate. I'm telling you, it's, but you've been really interesting. Oh, thank you very much. It's been really a pleasure chatting to you as well.